to be prepared for the injured worker. My name is Ann Perrotto Lurkey. I'm one of the physical therapists at the Hand and Shoulder Center, and I'll be your master of ceremonies today. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment just to go over a few things. Uh, each one of you received a tote bag when you registered this morning. In that tote bag, you should have a manual and a pen. If you signed up to get a paper handout, you should have that in there as well, and your name tag. On the name tag should be a matching sticker with what you ordered for lunch. So you need to have that on. That's going to be important. And you'll find a quarter-sized piece of cardstock with five squares. Later this morning, when we take a break and visit the expo table, take that card to get stamped at each table. And make sure your name is on, on the front of the card and turn it in after lunch for a door prize that will be drawn before the start of our afternoon speakers. So make sure you get a chance to visit all of our vendors. Uh, initially, or excuse me, additionally, you will have two other forms. One's going to be an evaluation form for the speakers and how to provide feedback on what you enjoyed and how we can enhance the symposium in the future. The second form is a trivia question from each presentation this morning. So if you answer those questions and turn it in before lunch, you'll be also entered for a door prize. So both forms can be turned in at the registration table or you can. So there are index cards on each table. Please write down your questions and the speaker's name of who the question is intended for, that we'll collect them at 11.30 for our morning panel. And that will be a great way to, to get a chance to have some of your questions answered from the panel up at the front. So if you have any questions throughout the day, please see Cassie or Mackenzie. And if you think you stand up, please, at the back of the room. So Cassie, there to the right, Mackenzie to the way right. Um, they've been instrumental in um, planning and organizing today. So it's been great. Another little housekeeping thing in the back, since we came in the door, they're going to be down the hall and to the right. Um, morning snacks and lunch are going to be over to the left in the corner, and there are pitchers of water on every table. Um, they'll be refilled throughout the day and during breaks. So let's get started. We have great speakers set up for today with cutting edge material. Our first speaker is newer to our practice, but has been practicing for over 20 years. Dr. Sean Hennigan is a board-certified orthopedic surgeon with a subspecialty focus on shoulder and elbow surgery. He sees a large volume of problems ranging from relatively simple to complex. He completed his residency at Rush University in Chicago, Illinois, and his fellowship in shoulder and elbow surgery at the University of Pennsylvania. He came to our practice in 2020 for Marie Bay. Dr. Hennigan will be talking about common workplace injuries to the shoulder and elbow. Please welcome Dr. Sean Hennigan. Sounds good work. Thanks everybody for coming this morning and uh, a special thank you to all the people at Hand and Shoulder who spent a lot of work and time putting this symposium together. For those who haven't done this before, it's, it's quite a, uh, a time and laborious uh, process. So, much thanks to them for putting this together for us. So I want to take a little bit of a different uh, approach to discussing shoulder problems. Um, we're surgeons who would like to do surgery, but only a very small percentage of people who actually have with their problems need surgery. That's a good thing. Uh, many of them be treated by therapists and, uh, and do this fine work for part of an operation. Uh, so I wanted to sort of step back and just sort of acknowledge that people get into our system uh, with a shoulder injury. That patient represents a small percentage of people who actually have the underlying problem that we discussed pretty quickly there. So this is more of a sort of a 30,000 foot view uh, looking at how we manage your gut disorders. So we'll, we'll get into and talk a little bit about where a patient comes in and where they may end up in terms of options for management. But I think it's important to realize that not everybody's going to be in the operating room, thankfully. Uh, and at the very end, we'll touch on some lateral elbow pain as well. Um, so Ann already uh, told you a little about myself. I'm a Philadelphia guy, medical school, born and raised. Uh, five years in Chicago and spent a year back in uh, Philadelphia for a fellowship. I actually practiced in northeastern Pennsylvania for several years before I moved to uh, Green Bay. Uh, and I joined this group in March of 2020, and it's been a, it's been a great experience for me. Uh, 
just some disclosures about myself that probably aren't that perfect for today's talk. So we know rotator cuff tears are fairly common, uh, but do they all require surgery? You get a guess what the answer is. So we know from a number of studies, this is just one that I picked out of many, uh, it was published in 1999 in the German Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, where they looked at the incidence of rotator cuff tears in asymptomatic patients, so they don't have to solicit volunteers. If you shoulder pain, no, would you like to be involved in the study? Uh, they did clinical assessment and ultrasound studies, and you can see here by this chart that the incidence of rotator cuff tears increases as a function of age. So a rotator cuff tear is a normal consequence of aging. Here you look at the 50 to 59 bracket, right? 13% of patients without symptoms have a rotator cuff tear. This is a full thickness tear based on percent of examination. And the incidence goes up by the decade. And so if we look across the population, if everybody got a cuff tear in an operation, I would never see my family. <laughs> so the challenges are this. Um, who needs surgery? Uh, so what are the indications for considering an operation? Um, what is the best treatment for that individual's patient? For that individual patient and their concerns? Some people have concerns related to function. Some people have concerns related to pain. Some people have both. Some people have, like I said before, an asymptomatic tear, which doesn't usually require any treatment at all. Um, so the treatment algorithm is not binary. It is not, as a tear cuff tear, you need surgery. So I, would, I put this picture of this guy up here because I, I think that one of the things we all need to be cautious about is that when one wields a hammer, the world begins to look like a nail. And if you have relationships with people who see a patient and get an MRI scan and do an operation, you might reconsider that relationship. Um, so a little bit about the shoulder. I like to describe the patients that the shoulder sort of functions almost like a tug of war. Um, what I mean by that is that if you look at the far left side, uh, there's an upward arrow, and that is within the deltoid muscle. So the deltoid originates off of the acromion on top of the shoulder, and attaches to the humerus. So when that deltoid muscle contracts to elevate the arm, it has a net result in an upward vector, causing the humeral head to translate to superior. And that upward pull of the humeral head is countered by the all four rotator cuff tendons, which originate off of the scapula attached to the humerus, and those muscles all pull the humeral head into the center part of the socket. So the cuff forms a dynamic fulcrum so that the deltoid can elevate the arm. So if the rotator cuff goes sideways, the deltoid begins to move into the war and the head begins to migrate superiorly. Those altered mechanics lead to the generation of the shoulder and ultimately rotator cuff tear on the body. So the purpose of the cuff is to balance and center the humeral head dynamically so the deltoid can elevate the arm. Of course, you know each individual muscle anywhere in the body has its function determined by where it originates and where it inserts. So each individual rotator cuff tendon uh, attaches to a part of the humerus. So for the, you know, the subscap, for example, attached to the front, its job is to rotate the hand internally toward the abdomen. And like, likewise, the inverse band is teres minor rotate the arm externally. So each individual tendon has its specific function, but globally, Cup is the center of the head. So this diagram here, I thought it was baseball, it looks like it's salt water. Mm -hmm. um, but each person in the field has a specific function. The pitcher pitches, the first base plays first base. But collectively, their job is to get the person who's batting out before they cross over play the score. So again, we alluded to the rotator cuff deficient shoulder. Um, and here we see on the left radiograph is a normal x ray where the head looks well centered. And on the right, we see the humeral head is migrated over superiorly. There's virtually no space between the acromion and the top of the humeral head. And you actually see the head is beginning to wear into the superior aspect of the lung. So that's a cuff arc property. And we know that when the cuff becomes uh, not functional, uh, we result in superior instability of the shoulder. Patients typically lose forward flexion because of loss of deltoid tension. Uh, Blick's curve is disrupted. The deltoid has to waste its contraction to take slack out of the system. And these patients present many times with weakness, pain, and superior instability. Um, and their joint can go on to degrade and form of rotator cuff arthropathy. Don't we'll forget about the scapular muscles. That's another whole separate muscle system that attaches the axial spine to the shoulder. Uh, and the 
the scapula muscles are very important to stabilize the scapula so that when you use your arm or weight your body, there's a stable platform for which your hand can function. Um, and so anytime you evaluate a patient with shoulder pain, um, you must uh, pay very careful attention to the function of the scapula. Um, and uh, many times people can present with uh, quote unquote impingement. Uh, nobody's ever bothered to look at them uh, in a tank top with a shirt on to notice that their scapula was unstable, or they had some blunt press and nerve issue. Uh, and yes, they present with similar symptoms of subdeltoid pain as well. So if you're not identifying the, the root cause of the issue, you're going to chase the wrong thing and then pour out. This is a funny cartoon uh, of a guy who's trying to jump from one boat onto another. Have you ever tried to do this in a boat which wasn't a board or an anchor or a boat? When you jump from one boat, if the boat isn't moored or anchored, you will end up in the drink and not in the other boat we intended. So typical shoulder pain history, uh, patients with rotator cuff disorders typically present with very classic and self-deltoid pain. The common complaint that people have is pain that affects sleep. Either they can't get to sleep or if they roll onto their shoulder, they wake up with pain. Um, I'd like to find out what sort of uh, things help symptoms and what things exacerbate them. We need to always investigate the presence of associated symptoms. Probably at least three or four times a week someone comes in with shoulder pain uh, and we say, oh, do you have any numbness or pain in your arm? Yes, I do. Does it occur with the pain in your shoulder? Yes, it does. So you know, not everything that comes in with subdeltoid pain is in fact with your cuff. We need to make sure that we have the bone down the right path before we start getting too far down the road. Uh, there's also a subjective functional assessment that we do. It's a modification of the American Shoal Model Surgeon score. So every new patient in my office gets handed this form. It's not the same pretty color as black. But uh, on the left side is a series of functional questions. The patient can rate each arm. Unable to do great difficulties, mild difficulties, with no problem. And at the very end, we tally the points and you get a shoulder score. And this has been shown to be validated looking at patients uh, over the course of treatment. So we'd like to see that shoulder score improve the treatment. And we can monitor those things over time. And the dreaded visual analog scale, which everybody loves. But it's very difficult to get the general measure of the subjective complaint. That's the best we can for now. Part of the clinical evaluation always involves uh, inspection. And that means actually seeing skin. That means the patient can't come in with a shirt or coat with a scarf and mittens on. It's hard to see stuff. So we usually put them into a tank top or uh, maybe if it's a gentleman, they can remove their shirt for that part of the exam. But we always inspect them because you see things if you look. This is an arrow showing a guy who's got fairly significant wasting of his intraspinatus fossa. And that might give you some clues to what might be going on. Uh, palpation. Uh, so, Anytime I examine a patient, uh, the examination is very consistent. Um, we, we touch and feel and push on the same things in every single patient. You do things the same way every time. Uh, you don't miss things. Um, we always check range of motion, check active and passive motion. So active motion is a good function of what is their range like and how their muscles function. Um, and passive motion, we won't see if they're stiff or not good motion. Uh, we do a strength assessment of each of the tendons and muscles of the shoulder. And there's a series of provocative tests that we do as well. Uh, this is a video the gentleman here is going to demonstrate uh, the first video of what a normal subscapularis functions like. So he's doing an abdominal compression test. You see he's able to bring his elbow and move, his hand stays on his abdomen. On his right side, we passively bring his elbow forward and let it go and let his hand go. His elbow falls back and his hand can't stay on his abdomen. So he's got a weak subscap. Every new patient to me uh, typically gets a full series of x rays if you don't come with them already. It's four high quality images. And then, based upon examination history and x ray findings, uh, there may be an indication to do some advanced imaging, such as ultrasound or MRI scan. Typically, patients have a lot of these things that they can see me, but sometimes they don't. Um, but again, uh, the initial tennis treatment, avoid things that cause pain. Uh, treat 
symptoms of pain with usually anti-inflammatories and cold therapy. Uh, there is occasionally a role for a slight cortisone injection to help reduce symptoms. And then rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is very important uh, because there are certainly some things that can be corrected through exercise that result in reduction of symptoms. Uh, and we should certainly explore those options and make sure that we maximize their therapies and treatments before we get into anything more invasive with our patients. So this slide shows us the full spectrum of rotator cuff disease. Uh, so I love when people come in and say, oh, I think I have an opinion. I ask them, what does that mean? And they're like, oh. So impingement encompasses this whole spectrum of problems that we see, anything from the very top of the screen, an intact tendon, which is some pain, so that would be a tendonitis or a strain pattern. You can see tendinosis of the normal aging of tendon, or even a partial tear of that quotes again. Uh, it can progress to a full thickness tear, uh, which can be classified again based on the size and repairability and the presence or absence of arthritis. So all those things fall in the impingement category. Uh, what are the indications for rotator cuff repair? Well, it, as I quickly thought about this, for me, it's a young patient who is active, and needs a strong arm, has an acute tear, and has objective weakness on exam. Again, that's, that's sometimes a little tricky to figure out because weakness can be the result of pain as well. So we don't do it as much anymore, but there was an examination that we do called an impingement test, which was Basically, if someone comes in and has weakness with abduction, for example, and we would inject 10 cc's, which is plain lidocaine into their shoulder, and when their pain went away, suddenly their strength came back. So again, weakness is something you have to make sure that you're calling it weakness is not secondary pain, but true motor weakness. Subscapularis, there's that indication for repair. So if someone comes in and has that exam that you saw in the video, uh, that's going to get a scan and get pretty careful and fixed pretty soon. The subscapularis, as you know, is a massive muscle on the ventral surface of the scapula. And if that thing tears, it tends to retract quite quickly. And if you, uh, if you watch those for a while and you throw them on the cortisone a couple of times and you treat them six months later, sometimes it may be hard or possible to repair. The other indication would be somebody who has persistent pain despite a server management we earlier. Uh, most of the treatment, again, is minimizing painful activities, uh, focusing on rehabilitation and good mechanics. Uh, the role for cortisone injection for me is as somebody who has a sleep disturbance. It's probably the most common reason I offer an injection. Um, and I, I sometimes offer an injection if I think somebody has too much pain with activities to be able to participate in physical therapy. Um, but I want to emphasize the, the highly degree of the model. There was a recent well done look back study using a Humana or Medicare database where they looked back at patients who had a CPT code for cortisone injection. And they went back and looked at people who had shoulder surgery for rotator cuff repair. Uh, there was a clear correlation uh, with statistical significance uh, relating the number of steroid injections you had prior to repair and the risk of complications related to infection and healing. So uh, people start getting a bunch of cortisone injections. Then we move on to the next thing. What determines whether or not the rotator cuff is repairable, uh, in summary, has to deal with how long the tears were present. Um, and so we can get some information about the health of the muscle, the degree of retraction, and how far from the bone is the tendon pulled. Uh, we can get some information regarding the appearance of the tendon. Uh, you might see a, a, a tear where the tendon is quite retracted far away from here, just like the picture at the very bottom there. Uh, but sometimes you can look at the edge of the tendon and you see a lot of edema muscle or edema in the joint, uh, and you see the end of the tendon looks a little bit wavy, that would suggest perhaps more of an acute tear. Uh, and so when you see that wavy tendon appearance, and then if you look at the top view, the very superior aspects of the here, Yeah, So at the very top of my image, at the very center, you see there's a Y, which is the scapula. That is the supraspidatus muscle bone. And that muscle actually looks quite healthy. So this uh, MRI scan is a patient here. It looks like he's got a pretty substantial tear of retraction at the end. That looks kind of wavy, and the muscle looks pretty healthy. So that looks like a repairable tear. Uh, you can get some of this information from plain x-rays as well. Um, even from a plain x-ray, if you see on a plain film, the human head's already elevated, 
you're getting some sense that there's been a problem on them for quite a while, even though there's an acute event or something happened with their pain or uh, chances are that they've been something real little before they even had symptoms. Uh, you can get some information from these x-rays too. Uh, a grash review is one of the x-ray reviews I always get. But sometimes it's helpful if you do the grash in abduction, now the deltoid is contracting and pulls the head up. And so and with the arm by the side, the weight of the arm is pulling the head down, they give you a false sense of the head's well centered. Where if they initiate abduction and the head starts to migrate up, that would tell you that there's something chronic there as well. So we have a patient who's gone through all the operative treatment, has an examination of the body, so images that confirm a rotator cuff tear. How do you decide which way to go forward? This is really sort of the crux of our discussion today. So in a patient who uh, fails conservative management, and their MRI scan doesn't show a complete tear in the cuff, there's a little surgery for impingement, just doing the impingement surgery, which is to do chromioplasty, that is to remove that chromium spur that we see in the upper left converting it to a flat chromium, which is the second picture, the one to the right. Uh, it's very rare uh, in 22 years that I would do isolated chromium plastic in a patient. It happens, but it's really, really uncommon, maybe once every year or two. Uh, most often, if somebody's in surgery, even though their MRI scan didn't show a tear, there's other things that are pain generators in the shoulder. The most common ones that I see would be related to a painful AC joint. So many times that might be added to the resection of the distal bottom. And many times you might find some pathology related to the biceps anchor or the superior labor. And uh, one of the original papers that talked about uh, the benefits of arthroscopy versus open surgery, I think they reported somewhere to 10 or 13 percent uh, incidence of frontal cartilage injuries found. While there may not be anything to do with those type of surgery, certainly they may have an impact on prognosis in terms of I expect that patient to do and give us some information on what's going to happen in the future. Uh, again, the first line is the most important to be aware of common diagnosis. Uh, so we now have a patient who has the same clinical history, but the MRI scan shows some tendosis or maybe the quote unquote partial tear. Um, so at surgery, we pay careful attention to uh, the structural integrity of the tendon. And then structurally there's an impact, uh, but the MRI scan showed fairly significant tendinopathy. And their examination findings point to the cuff. Um, and they failed to do the There may be things that can be done to address that tendinopathy uh, surgically. We'll talk about some of those as well. Um, there's a reference to this uh, bioinductive allograft implant. We'll talk about that in just a few moments. So typically, if you're not doing a repair with your surgery, it could just be compressive surgery. The sling is worth upward for a week or maybe two, and maybe get some range of motion uh, fairly quickly. So this is what I was referring to before. Uh, so this patient had persistent shoulder pain, had an injection, got good relief, uh, been through rehabilitation, had pretty good function, but had accrued pain. MRI scan showed a lot of changes in the substance of the tendon itself. But the top two pictures show the arthroscopic pictures, the arthroscopic findings. And that little monofilm suture is what we call a marking stitch. So with the camera inside the shoulder joint, which is the upper right picture, we're looking up at the rotator cable. And that bicep tendon is the white tendon beginning from the left and coming down about the center part of the picture. Uh, that area that we marked with the with that monofilm suture corresponded to the findings of MRI scan. So we can actually identify and map out exactly where that tendon up is intended. We can mark it from inside the joint. And then the picture upper left uh, shows the bursal sites so we're now in the space looking down the rotator cuff. And the tendon looks kind of frayed right there. We take a little probe and we feel the tendon. We feel all around there and most of the tendon has a firm feel to it, nice pushback, a nice spring back on the probe. But right where that frayed tendon is, the probe sort of falls into the tendon. And you know, prior to having something like this, that would be one where the patient in the upper room might uh, breathe or complete that tear and maybe do a formal repair, which requires six weeks in the sling and a half a year of recovery. Uh, there's this novel approach now where we can kind of place this little 
It's a bovine uh, Achilles allograft, uh, which is inserted on this novel insertion device. And we can place that over top of the rotary cuff, and we use these little blue staples of the PLA, which is a resorbent material. And we can staple that graft down on the tendon. And uh, we can see the new tendon actually heal and regenerate and form a new tendon underneath there. And remarkably, some of these patients have come in and have multiple surgeries and uh, just have a look at the tendon and do this. And they come back to their months and say, I'm sure it's going to spend 20 years. Um, and when a rep told me this, I didn't believe it. I had about 10 people tell me this afterwards. I was sort of believing it. No, by the way, their, their recovery is fairly simple. This is all you do there in a slip for the week with your encourage to use your arm right away. Um, you let pain be their diet to activity. So people go back to work in a week or 10 days and back to waist level, chest level activity in a couple of weeks. So, talking about full thickness rotator cuff tears, so again, here's a spectrum of disorders that we see ranging from a small tear, which is up to one centimeter. Uh, all the way up to massive, not repairable, with the presence of arthritis and everything in between. Uh, so when somebody who has, again, failed conservative management, has symptoms, and ends up in the operating room, uh, we have a supraspinatus tear shown in the upper picture. We're looking at the tendon above, and the bone is down below, and you see the tendon's actually just lifted up off the bone and starting to pull away. Uh, so we can actually just repair that tendon down to there's a million different ways you can do it, um, and the surgeon is a technique. So whatever you get your best repair to get biomechanical stability and encourage tendon to bone healing, uh, that's the operation you do. It's a single row versus transalysis of bone row repairs, pros and cons of all those. Generally favorable outcomes regarding healing, pain away from return to function. Uh, you see your full recovery is fairly lengthy, depending on the size of the tear. Uh, depending on the constitution or the health of the patient. Um, and everybody's pretty important. People come with different conditions and issues, smokers and metabolic disease and all kinds of things. All those have an impact on healing recovery. Um, here's a picture of a subscapularis tear. Up the right picture shows a subscap sort of out there in the breeze and Google heads to the left. Um, so this, this patient had weakness and pain with his abdominal pressure testing. So, we're in surgery, we decided we're going to repair that tendon. So we place an anchor into the prepared gun of the normal head and pass some sutures through the subscap. And the lower picture is the that looks like it's attached to the gun. We have another variation of rotator cuff tears, the kind which you can't fix. These are not uncommon. Um, so of the non fixable kind, I like to classify those based on the presence of arthritis or no arthritis. So if somebody has arthritis, it's a different discussion. We'll get into that briefly. But the non-repairable cuff tear has no arthritis. The treatment may depend upon the location of the tear and some of the specifics regarding the patient, the symptoms you're having, uh, what their functional deficits are. And there is a whole variety of options that can be done, uh, many with good reported results. The notion of a partial repair it's back to a concept uh, put out by a work based surgeon named Steve Burkhart. He talked about the force couples of the shoulder and how somebody can have a supraspinatus tear and have pretty good function and reasonable uh, pain relief. Uh, but if they lose some of the posterior cuff, then their anterior and posterior cuff can't function together to keep the head ball centered and they start to decompensate. So sometimes you have a non repairable supraspinatus tear, someone has an injury where they extend the tear and now they decompensate and become weak. But if the supraspinatus isn't repairable, there's reasonably good results in trying to repair just the supraspinatus alone and restoring that force couple. And there's been improvement in pain and improvement in function. Uh, that was probably 20 years ago, and there's been a number of things that have noticed since that time. So we tried to improve upon that by trying to get full coverage of the human that we were able to. Uh, you have this uh, next option, SCR, which is a superior capsule reconstruction, which we'll touch on a little bit. There's a lower trapezius transfer uh, to the humerus. Uh, a newer option here called the in-space balloon. And, and in select cases, you may consider reverse shoulder arthroplasty in somebody who has a pseudo-paralytic shoulder. Uh, a lot of pain, but no arthritis yet. This is a diagram showing the unrepairable subscapularis. It's a right shoulder here. Um, and 
So subscapular tears, even when they're chronic, are generally repairable, but sometimes not. In a scenario where that tendon isn't repairable, and they have gain and functional deficit, uh, you can, through an open incision, go down and release some or all of the pec major to identify the dissonance. Uh, you can release the dissonance, um, and you can mobilize that dissonance tendon up and reattach that to the left tuberosity. And since that comes off of the scapula, it does have that internal rotation vector on the humerus space where the muscle originates and where it attaches. We used to do split pec major transfer with this, but it didn't work so well, so we don't do this. Typically, it takes longer to regain motion and function after this. Patients typically do report an improvement in pain. They have an improvement in their shoulder scores. Um, subjective functional assessments as well. Again, it's a lengthy recovery. But again, the right patient is a decent option. So non repairable supraspinatus where the subscap is intact and the posterior cuff is intact. So they have weakness and abduction, but they don't have a lag sign and you can place their arm out next to a rotation, they can hold it there. Uh, this is an option which was uh, pretty uh, pretty popular and sexy for a while. I think over time what's happened is that some of the mid and long range results have begun to sort of spoil the, the party. Uh, but this is an uh, option is taking a thermal allograph, usually three or four millimeters in thickness, and you attach one end to the upper aspect of the conoid and you reattach the other end to and it acts like a reverse trampoline, so it statically or passively depresses the human head. Um, and some studies, uh, many spots of it, don't push this technique, I uh, show great results. Um, but again, I think you have to be careful and look at the mid and long range. I think we're starting to see higher rates of failure these days, five to seven years. So I think this is, at least in my practice, is sort of falling, falling out a little bit. Well, I have a patient so I'm not doing as much more than it's irritating to see the break for the first time. Um, there's something newer that was, uh, it's been an IDE now for four or five years. Um, and there was just a paper published that followed the results of this. This is an FDA approved now. Basically, it's a balloon that's made of the same materials of micro suture. And that gets inserted arthroscopically into the shoulder. It's about a 10 minute procedure. Um, you put that balloon into the shoulder based on the patient's size. And if you have uh, a syringe and you can inject saline and you can inflate this balloon. And the balloon goes in between the chromium and the human head and actually keeps the human head depressed. Um, and that material completely dissolves in about six months. But some of the long-term results, which should say mid-range results, four or five years out, patients are still maintaining their function, have much less pain. And much like that genitin, this is something you can do on some AD. Again, I think some pretty promising results. So at least in my practice, I suspect that this is based on is probably going to replace the SCR, um, at least the majority of patients in my practice. So it's a different beast. We were talking about the non-repairable supraspinatus, but we have a non-repairable posterior cup as well. So infraspinatus, or much less commonly, tears minor. So the top diagram is showing a posterior view uh, and shows you Trapezius muscle, it's a massive muscle that has the upper trap that comes off the base of the occiput and inserts on the lateral aspect of the upper part of the scapular spine. And then the other major functional piece of the trapezius is the lower trap, and that comes off the lower throat for a the dorsal fascia. It attaches to the medial side of the inferior part of the scapular spine. So the idea behind uh, this lower trapezius transfer is that you make an incision along the medial aspect of the spine, you detach the lower trapezius and you mobilize it. Uh, and since that tendon doesn't reach into the humerus, uh, you basically connect the Achilles allograft to the humeral head like you would a rotator cuff repair, and you pass that graft underneath the skin, and you, you tension that graft with the arm and external rotation, and you pair the lower trapezius to the allograft, so that acts like an intercalar graft. Uh, I usually brace the next rotation for six, six or eight weeks, let that graft heal in. And then by training their lower trapezius to contract and help his arm, you can reverse the lag sign and you can improve the forward flexion. Um, that's been something which I've been doing quite a bit more on. It's really been a nice salad for people who have very poor posterior cuff function, not repair or tear, and no arthritis. Uh, this 
is a Dr. Al Sun. He um, he's the one who sort of popularized this technique. But he wasn't there, but he's now a mass general. Um, he worked with the brachial plexus team, and he used to do all these muscle transfers with people with brachial plexus injuries. And sort of found a new application for this tendon transfer to somebody who had uh, poor posterior cuff function. So he's published a number of papers. This one here is showing um, 14 months out very significant improvements in most of the subjective uh, functional surveys, including uh, shoulder value dashboard, great improvements in pain and range of motion as well. So on to non-repairable rotator cuff tears in the presence of arthritis. Uh, once you see arthritis and soft tissue operations in terms of salvage procedures, SCR, lower track transfer, uh, those salvage operations are out the window because it was about a 90% reported failure. In other words, the arthritis progresses even to be successful through the transfer of the SCR. So when these patients who have arthritis and non-repairable cuff tears with significant pain, uh, this is a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. This device statically centers the humerus over the monoid in a way that the cuff can't do dynamically. This pretensions the delta in the models of patients who have pseudoparalytic arms and pain to be able to get their arms from their bed. And this has been reverse shoulder basically FDA approved in 2004. And the last 16, 17 years, it's, it's been unbelievable. And the people that um, we're doing this on now, the people that have this operation. One downside to the reverse replacement, based on the design of the device, is that patients typically will lose internal rotation. So they many times get their hand to their back pocket, maybe even to the middle. Uh, but ladies aren't going to be able to fasten the problem in their back anymore. They don't be able to reach up very far, uh, with a few exceptions, of course. This is a reverse shoulder case in somebody who had really profound upper arthropathy. In fact, the lower edge of the scapula actually reverted into the humerus. She wore away uh, probably about two centimeters of bone from upper monoid. So for her, when we resected the humeral head, we were able to use that bone graft to build up the monoid. So you'll see behind the base plate where the spear is, there's a little lucency there. That's her initial post op extra. And that area is basically the humeral head was repurposed to build the monoid. We've been able to restore her kinematics. This lady who's 70 years old, the show you every head. She has about 160 degrees of forward elevation, where she about four degrees. So that's kind of a wrap for the shoulder stuff, kind of briefly touch on this model elbow pain. It's a favorite topic for most of us who see pain the um, So this for a long time was called lateral epitonitis. Um, people still use that term, but I think it's falling out of favor. It's more of epitonalosis or epitonalgia pain. It refers to a degenerative tendinopathy in the outside part of the elbow as well, not an extensive tendon. But as you see here, there's a number of other things that also will cause lateral elbow pain. And again, if you don't have the right diagnosis, you can't possibly get the right outcome. So we see other causes for lateral elbow pain with the radial tunnel syndrome, or compression of the posterior process nerve as it passes through the supinator. Um, synovial plica can create lateral elbow pain that can mimic epicondylitis or epicondylgia. And then other conditions as well, cervical radiopathy, arthritis, a number of other things too. So again, the careful history is uh, quite important. Uh, timeline of symptoms, was it acute or was it more of an insidious onset? What is the exact location of the pain? Because many of these things I pointed to are all in a very small area, and you have to sort of try to fetter out which one it is that's causing the symptoms. What sort of things exacerbate or improve the symptoms? Our differential diagnosis we talked about, uh, at least in my practice, tendinopathy issues are far more common than nerve issues but we many times see those things together. Uh, lateral home, lateral ligament injury, especially in somebody who's already had surgery for metacondylitis. Um, sometimes if the surgeon gets a little bit aggressive and goes a little bit too far posterior, you may end up the origin of lateral home, lateral ligament. And so people can come in with recalcitrant lateral bubble pain and they went in with a tendon problem, now they have a tendon problem and a ligament problem. Pathologic synovial plica, again, neck issues can Masquerade has a lot of public pain. This is a schematic drawing uh, showing that it's smoking with a plank that it looks like. 
So we're looking at the radial head down below and the cat tongue above. And the elbow capsule sometimes can have a normal redundancy where that capsule invaginates in between those structures. And occasionally something can happen where that little band of tissue can become inflamed and can thicken. And occasionally you can reproduce some of the mechanical symptoms of the office. Um, and, uh, maybe then with this uh, snow plate condition. Back to this uh, tennis elbow, uh, there's an MRI image here. I don't do a lot of MRIs for this condition because they always look worse than you think they should. They don't really usually affect how you treat somebody. Uh, but on the left side, they're showing sort of normal, common extensive origin. And in the middle, the picture of the second MRI image shows some inflammation and fluid that is present within the ECRB where the tendon attaches to the end of these uh, pictures to the right, where, where histologic slides are showing what a normal tendon looks like histologically and what this tendonopathy looks like um, under the microscope. Um, so typically, you know, as we age, and remember that slide we talked about, uh, aging of the rotator cuff, um, as the common extensor tendons age, uh, the, the tissue has less capacity to hold hydration, so the MRI starts to look kind of bad in the second third decade of life. Some elastin fibers disappear, the tendon basically dry rots. Um, and sometimes people can have an overuse issue with the arm, or perhaps they develop a bit of a microscopic tear in that degenerative tendon. Um, and they continue using the arm then when the microscopic tear doesn't ever really heal. And eventually they recommend the rigorous diagnosis. So the examination is really the, the, the tenets of trying to sort stuff out. This is a pretty decent diagram showing where people who have tennis elbow have symptoms directly over the epicondyle. Sometimes it can be a little bit anterior, sometimes it can be just distal to the epicondyle. Um, but the radial teletennis is about you know, four or five centimeters distal to that uh, over the dorsal forearm. So if you're not really careful with how you examine somebody, you can, you can press on the forearm or elbow and they say, ouch, and you say, oh, that's tennis elbow. May not be a tendon problem, all maybe from a neurologic issue. Um, we always look for the presence of an effusion, so we feel for the soft spot, which is between the epicondyle and the point of the electronaut. And sometimes you can feel an effusion in there. You push directly in there and you feel a little bit of effusion. Um, they're painful right over the right of the joint. I can tell you again, it's not a tendon issue, it's maybe a little joint issue. It could be a plague, it could be an effusion, or arthritis, it could be a number of things. Uh, we typically do provocative testing to see if the tendons are involved, so we ask them to uh, extend their wrist against resistance, come with the elbow extended, and if they are pain with that, that usually would suggest more of a tendon problem. Because if you press directly over the uh, radial tunnel, uh, and you ask them to forcibly supinate their arm for a primation of supination, if that pain is elicited directly where you're pressing over the radial tunnel, that would suggest maybe more of a nerve compression issue. If you can reproduce clicking in the radiocapital joint as you rotate your forearm, that's where their pain is. That may suggest there may be something more joint related, the like the band loose body arthritis. This is the diagram showing radial tunnels in the yellow uh, is the nerve. And that radial uh, nerve comes down, uh, forms the dorsal branch of the radial nerve, and about three or three and a half centimeters distant to the radial head that nerve. And this arcade approach at the leading edge of the supinator, and as that nerve passes underneath the superficial part of the supinator, it can become compressed by the supinator. But many times when we decompress these nerves, we might see little vascular leashes that are on top of this. Um, so uh, sometimes that may be a cause of the lateral pain as well. So again, here's an examination plot you shown with the classic kind of cell location. Um, I like to use injections in the elbow help me to differentiate some of these causes of pain. So if somebody has pain which I think is tendon related, I want to confirm that's the case, I may inject by the tendon. And if that alleviates all of their pain, uh, that strongly suggests that the pain is coming from. If only half the pain gets better, but they still have some aching discomfort in their form, I may send them to have an ultrasound guided injection of the radial tunnel. Um, and so for me, that injection is a seated nerve. 
they usually inject some local anesthetic with or without cortisone. But what I'd like to see is uh, them develop weakness in their MCP, which means we anesthetize them correctly. And if when their MCP extension is weak, their pain goes away, but when the extension returns, their pain returns. That to me is about the best test to see if the real tunnel, uh, the PIN may be compressed at the real tunnel. Sometimes we even inject the joint as well to see if it's sort of Here's an ultrasound picture of Shelton and how they use the probe to see the nerve of the rear tunnel and they can, under correct vision, they can very safely place the needle right next to the nerve and make sure they get it in spot. So it's a busy slide. I won't get too far into this, but you see there's a whole bunch of different things that people can, they can use to treat these uh, conditions. Most of this is dealing with the tendinopathy issue in the tennis elbow. So it begins with avoiding painful activities, uses some therapy for some self-care, stretching, um, exercise to try to strengthen them. We don't get those muscles because when they have pain, they don't use the arm. And as a result of lack of use, many times they lose function, loss of function makes it hurt more, and we get into this vicious cycle. So we try to reverse that cycle again. Here's a role from counter horse bracing to be used periodically, uh, analgesics, selective cortisone injections. Uh, Nice and serious studies done showing that the use of platinum with plasma is as efficacious as steroid without the downside. So it'd be nice if we at some point could have payers actually pay for this treatment. Uh, as of right now, pay people to get a therapy injection, which is a cash um, procedure out of pocket. Um, sometimes that's a detriment for people getting care of them. Um, bone marrow aspirin, the same idea, a bit more expensive, maybe a little more efficacious, but not well studied yet. Uh, so people have started using Botox, actually. Because you paralyze the muscle and it doesn't pull the tendon because the tendon has a chance to heal. Uh, so that might be something to think about in the future. It's a picture of the counterforce brace. Commonly see people get a counterforce brace and they bring it home, they put it on, and they wear it for three months straight. And that's probably not good. So I like to have people use this if they're laborers. Maybe they work for a few hours. The pain starts to get bad. They wear the brace for an hour, for 90 minutes, take it off work again in the afternoon and put it on. So it's really meant just to give you a little break because if you wear this all the time, again, you need additional muscles. Uh, non operative treatment is successful at 90%, 95% is probably accurate. Um, non op care works for most of these people if you wait long enough. The question we have to deal with all the time is can they return back and be gainfully employed and recreate new things? But if you wait long enough, usually this product corrects itself. I don't offer more than one course of injection. Again, a similar study looks back at outcomes of tennis elbow surgery. People that have one injection and they require surgery typically have a 90 plus percent of their excellent result. Two injections drops down to 85 percent, three injections 65 percent, four injections forget it. So again, multiple injections, no way. Uh, if the course is pops, but it doesn't last very long, I would offer the PRP. Uh, typically, people will receive some form of active care for this tendon issue for at least six to nine months. Not six to nine months of symptoms, six to nine months of active care. And then surgery can be successful uh, if the correct patient is slightly. Uh, this is a fairly classic procedure. It was described by Marshall. Um, it was in the 70s sometime. Basically, you find the common extensive origin surgery through a small incision. You open up the interval between the ECRO or the longest, which looks muscular digitorum commonus, which looks more tendinous, and you open up the interval and the ECRP looks down below. Uh, you basically just excise all that mucoid appearing tissue. Uh, the histologic picture we had a few slides back basically shows the classifying of this angioplastic hyperplasia. Uh, usually when I excise the tendon, I'll vent the bone, which means I'll make a few drill holes in the bone to kind of get some bleeding, and I'll just reattach the longest back to the commonus. Uh, but there's been probably 20 or more different procedures described for this condition. Uh, 10x1, or TH release. Some people just get really uh, aggressive with an injection of the needle and they just poke it in the most times and hopefully that would create the same kind of response as the surgery was. This is a arthroscopic picture of a patient who had a cylindrical plica. Uh, 
Uh, so a lot of times if you're in there to take care of this, you're going to scope the elbow and see that there's a, that redundant piece of capsule that's sort of invaginated in and sending to the rear of the capsule. So you basically want to just resect that baby tissue and it usually resolves in kind of a simple this is a surgical photograph showing the rail nerve. There's a vascular leash in the middle of the screen kind of crossing over. So when you release this nerve, you basically just dissect the nerve all the way up and down as far as you can see. You basically release it and it's crossing over the rest of the nerve. It's interesting when you do this operation. Uh, when you first see the nerve, you begin to dissect around it. Every time you mechanically come near the nerve, or you can touch it with an instrument, the hand twitches. Every time you've done the operation, the twitching is all the way. I wish we did the nervous creating so it was going away. 